Welcome to another Next Gen Console Watch 2020, our show where we follow all the news and rumors on the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. Something tells me today we're going to be talking about a little bit more about one than the other. I'm David Hatfield, and as always, I'm joined by Ryan McCaffrey, host of IGN's Xbox Podcast, Podcast Unlocked. Hey, David. And Jonathan Dornbush, host of IGN's PlayStation Podcast, Podcast Beyond. A hearty beyond to you, David. And oh, gentlemen, so much to talk about today. Uh, well, I... So we just, we're just coming out of uh, Sony's big PS5 reveal event. I thought it was a very strong showing. We're in a strange uh, situation now where Sony bows out of E3 last year, has nothing to show around E3, was going to skip E3 again this year, but then with E3 canceled, they're back with an E3-level press conference, and Microsoft is nowhere to be found. I feel like they uh, sort of uh, took a lot of the wind out of Microsoft's sales, uh, sales today. Jonathan, let's start with you. What, your, what were your impressions of the show? Did it do its job to get people excited for the PS5? And I asked that knowing full well people were already excited for PS5. <laughs> I mean, I was excited for the PS5, but I think Sony needed to give us actual reasons to be excited. And I do really think this uh, a little over an hour long conference really did. Uh, it opened and closed with huge exclusives. It had a lot of really interesting mixes of independent games that are exclusive or console exclusive, some third party stuff that is also console exclusive or multi-platform. Um, you know, it, it can't really show us all of the reasons why the PS5 is this leap from the PS4 when it comes to some of the SSD stuff, the haptic mm -hmm. feedback, all, all of the bells and whistles we've heard about. But as a showing of great games you're going to be playing on the PS5, I think this was a stellar first showing. And Ryan, what did you think? We've talked a lot about how quiet uh, Sony has been uh, talking about next gen. They've allowed Microsoft to sort of lead the conversation so far. Uh, how do you feel after viewing today's show? Yeah, I agree with Jonathan. I mean, they did a fantastic job kind of put all their eggs in one basket with this PlayStation 5 event. So it was a high risk. Like if they if they flubbed this, then the the PS5 would be uh, the messaging, you know, the, the enthusiasm for it would be would be hurting, but they did not. They did a tremendous job right from that opening sizzle. Sony is so good at those hype sizzles where they can just show you all these cool moments at and then just opening with Spider-Man uh, Miles Morales, which which was one of the games we've talked on this show, Jonathan had theorized, we'd probably either see Spider-Man at launch or Horizon Zero Dawn 2, and we're getting Spider-Man, and that was just a heck of a way to kick things off. The show was just packed uh, full of games uh, and announcements. It was a, what, an hour and 15 minutes long. Game after game after game, I started to wonder if we were even going to see the hardware, but of course, uh, there at the very end, we finally did see the PlayStation 5 hardware itself, including the regular edition and a digital-only uh, edition. So tell me about your responses to the hardware. What was your impression, Jonathan? Uh, so we've actually been talking, the podcast Beyond Crew has been talking a lot about how we hoped it looked a little weird because the mm. DualSense was such a visual jump from the DualShock 4, like it looks so sci-fi futuristic. And I have to say the console did not d disappoint in doing that. Um, I, it is a little goofy, yes, but I kind of like that it's taking a bit of a risk in the visual design. Um, I think some of the design you can clearly see in the video is to give it a lot of ventilation, which given the fact that my PS4 Pro sounds like a jet engine every time I turn it on is something I am very happy with. Uh, it, you know, it looks like a, a high-end PC tower that someone modded with custom face plates and things like that. Is it silly? Yes, but I, I I kind of like that it's silly in this weird futuristic way. Yeah, although as impressed as I was with Sony's overall showing today, I have to say I'm, I'm more of a fan of the a uh, uh, little bit more reserved, sleek, classy X Xbox Series X design. Ryan, what did you think? Yeah, I'm with you on that, Damon. I do. I, I like minimalist design mm -hmm. in like all of my stuff, whether it's a, a car, a console, uh, what have you. But I do. I'm. I still like it though. I'm with Jonathan. Like it looks like a skyscraper in Dubai. Like yeah. it's 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 kind of this thing of excess, almost kind of like a like it sort of reminds me of a custom PC tower from the '90s or 2000s. But I do like it. I will say, as the Xbox guy on this program, <laughs> uh, I, I do actually think it's kind of reminiscent of the original Xbox 360 inhale design, mm -hmm. where it sort of you know sucks in at the middle, and and that's not a bad thing. Like that was a nice, elegant console design for the time, and and I think it's uh, it'll serve the the PlayStation 5 very well here. 
Yeah, and they also revealed a digital edition, which was uh, surprising to me. I don't know about you guys. I wasn't necessarily expecting that from Sony. There are many rumors about uh, about a Lockhart uh, secondary skew for the Xbox Series X, um, but that hasn't even been officially confirmed yet. Now we know for sure uh, the PlayStation 5 will have a digital-only edition. Jonathan, was that a surprise to you? It was. Honestly, the way Sony's been talking about the PS5, I really did think at launch we were just going to get one model. Um, this does, to me kind of possibly indicate the price than we may want out of the PS5 at launch, given the two editions. My assumption is taking out that hard, uh, the disk drive will save on costs if they have the same uh, storage space. We'll see if that happens. Um, they didn't announce any of those details, but, you know, game digital sales have been up continuously over the years, and especially in the last few months as we've all been acclimated to living from home and sheltering in place. So it makes sense to offer that now. Of course, Microsoft had the Xbox One S or the Xbox One S Digital Edition, uh, maybe a little bit of ahead, ahead of its time now, but uh, I, I think it's a smart move. They they didn't say anything about the digital edition being less powerful than the regular no. PS5. But Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong. The rumors about the Lockhart is, are that it is less powerful than the Series X, isn't that right? Correct. So these are this would be a, a definitive difference in strategy uh, where Microsoft trying to make the the next generation more affordable by having a less a definitively less powerful, uh, cheaper diskless, you know, all digital edition that'll still probably have the the baseline next gen features like the super fast and uh, NVMe SSD hard drive and, and maybe a couple of the other bells and whistles that Series X and next gen are doing. But but yeah, the the, the widespread rumors are that the Lockhart is uh, physically less capable capable than the Series X. All right, let's start getting into the games. Uh, I think for me, the the Ratchet and Clank game, I, I forget the, the full title of that game. Rift uh, Apart. Rift Apart. I think that's maybe the most impressive next-gen demo uh, that I've seen yet, uh, showing you showing you whip, whip zip between different planets and different universes in a second. You, you have to have those whole worlds just sort of waiting in the background of the game, ready to load in an instant. And at least from the demo we saw today, that appeared to be what was happening. Uh, so Jonathan, did you feel like this was that was actually a glimpse as to what the PS5 could be bringing to the table? Yeah, this felt like the clearest, here is what the PS5 can do yeah. when it comes to the SSD. Um, you know, they've talked about erasing loading times and not having mm -hmm. elevators or hallways that you go through to get from one area to the next. And this really felt like showing, hey, we're not just going through hallways, we're going through space to be able to go from yeah. one planet to the next. And so I think this was a really smart showing with a familiar franchise that PlayStation fans love that comes off of the really well-acclaimed 2016 reboot refresh of the series. Yeah. So I think this is a really, really smart play for them. Yeah. Yeah. Was this one impressive to you, Ryan? It's, I am so right there with you guys. I actually thought this was the most technically impressive game we saw today. I mean, we saw great stuff. I mean, the, the little snippets of, of Spider-Man Miles Morales were great. There were plenty of beautiful games, but for the exact reasons you guys are talking about, this was the showcase. It feels like this Ratchet & Clank game was built specifically to show off, hey, this is what our new hard drive system can do it, and and i'll tell you it's a much better it looks it looks like it's going to be a much better showcase by any metric than knack was <laughs> yeah. with the ps4 like you know a cute cartoony family friendly thing that show that's there to kind of be a tech demo as well this is uh this was really super impressive and by the way insomniac games already paying huge dividends mm -hmm as the most recent first party acquisition for Sony between of course Spider-Man from a couple of years ago and now we've got Spider-Man 2 as as the premier launch title we'll talk about that I know and then Ratchet and Clank really showing off the, the capabilities of the console so Insomniac just they were the big winner today for sure and you mentioned Spider-Man Miles Morales uh Jonathan you reviewed Spider-Man uh for IGN tell us about your reaction to Miles Morales today uh, I was really excited to see that, you know, I think Miles was kind of where a lot of us were expecting and hoping the franchise would continue because the the character and the world building we get with him in the first game is so great. Uh, and I think everyone was really left wanting, hey, let's get Miles into the spider suit and let's be Miles. And so for this to come right out of the gate and be a holiday launch window launch day game for the ps5 is one of the smartest moves i think sony could make like the spider-man on ps4 is one of the best-selling ps4 exclusives it's the best-selling superhero game of all time like this is going to sell ps5s but let's get back 
on track to talking about all the games that we just saw, the big PS5 reveal of them. Uh, as we're talking, very impressive showing today. But one of the strange parts of the show, I thought, was that it opened up with GTA V. Uh, the fact that it's, <laughs> it, it's coming to PlayStation 5 and is apparently going to be free to PlayStation Plus subscribers. Did you think that was a strange way to open the show, Jonathan? I think it was strange. I think it shows that a lot of money went into putting that there because it almost opened before the even like proper PlayStation showcase uh, intro graphics seemed to come up. So I think that was definitely a like rock star PlayStation deal uh, that went through and led to that. But, you know, GTA 5 is one of, if not the biggest games of all time. It's one of the most acclaimed games of all time. Not a bad game to tell a large audience who was obviously watching the stream that you're going to have this in next gen. Yeah, Ryan, you reviewed GTA V for uh, IGN, I believe. Was this... Oh, I wish I had. I didn't, oh, but no, you boy, didn't. I, but, uh, but I do think, I couldn't agree with the 10 we gave it at the time more. Gotcha. I genuinely think it's one of the greatest games of all time. And, and, and this thing is now going to span three generations because, remember, it debuted on the PS3 and the 360 right. seven years ago, sep uh, September of 2013. And then the twenty in holiday twenty fourteen, we got the uh, the PS four and Xbox One versions that added the the first person mode among other things, and and now here it's going to live on into the PS five Series X generation, and and I'm thrilled about that because it's it's just a tremendous game. In fact, the, I will say it made me watching that at the beginning of the conference, I was a little puzzled, like, mm -hmm. wait, why are they showing a PS four game to start? Yeah. But it, it did make me want to go back and play some GTA V because I, I love that game. I thought maybe it was going to be a new expansion that was coming to PS5 or something like that, but no. just Yeah, it's that single-player DLC that we never got. <laughs> yeah. um, we saw a lot of third-party exclusives today, um, which is pretty interesting. Two games from Bethesda, Ghostwire Tokyo and Deathloop, and then uh, Project Athea, which is from Square Enix, which I thought looked actually really, really cool. Um, this is just sort of a, another area that Sony seems to uh, excel in. Jonathan, were, were you surprised that two Bethesda games are going at least, at least timed exclusive to PS5? Uh, yeah, actually quite surprised because we saw both of those games at E3 last year and it was sort of a, oh, this will be coming to everything. This is just, mm -hmm. you know, a cool new a uh, couple of IPs from Bethesda, but no, the, these coming, I think, on PlayStation First is going to be a big deal for people who were blown away by these two last year and by these pretty impressive uh, longer showings that we got this time, especially with Deathloop coming this holiday season. That's going to be, you know, an early PS5 game that you can pick up. That's going to be a, a pretty cool get for them, I think. Mm -hmm. hey, Ryan, what was your reaction to these third-party exclusives? Yeah, I mean, it's just, a, it's, an, it's an area where Sony continues, that that's, that's how they're going to stay ahead. Like Microsoft can't or won't hmm. get these third-party exclusives, particularly out of Japan, you know, with Square Enix and then uh, Tango Gameworks with through Bethesda there on uh, on Ghostwire. The, the, you know, the Xbox has, it's never had a presence in Japan. So I don't mean, I don't know if that's a factor in, in these deals. I assume it probably is. But yeah, I mean, these are, we've seen Sony do this all generation long, most recently, what a month ago with uh, with Final Fantasy VII right, remake that's right. on a one year timed exclusive, but Microsoft did this five years ago with uh, with uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider, and it sort of it managed to publicly backfire on them, even though that was a phenomenal like game of the year contender kind of game. But Microsoft's got to they got to start doing this. I mean, it's it's it clearly works. That's the thing. So it's like, why wouldn't you? buy a PlayStation 5 when you know you're not just going to be getting all the great first party mm -hmm. Sony games, but you're going to be getting cool stuff like like a uh, Ghostwire and and hopefully Deathloop looked really good and and uh, whatever, you know, whatever the the Project Athea turns into, but mm -hmm. I mean it's really impressive stuff that that yeah is is coming to PlayStation 5 first. It's great for them. All right, we've got fin we finally got confirmation that uh Resident Evil 8 or Resident Evil Village is uh a real thing coming next year, coming 2021. Uh, I, I'm a fairly typical Resident Evil fan in that I, I think this series had sort of lost its way and then found its footing again with Resident Evil 7. So I'm totally excited for Resident Evil 8. But what about you, Jonathan? For me, I, I was a bit of a latecomer to the series as a whole and 7 kind of kickstarted my real interest and love for it. Oh, wow. um, but this seems to really be hearkening back. Uh, Brian Altano on Podcast Beyond is a huge Resident Evil fan. And this seems to be taking all the right boxes for RE1 and RE4 fans with some hints of like a mansion and the more 
uh, village rural area sort of thing that we've seen here. Uh, I think this was really playing to a lot of the different Resident Evil fan bases all at the same time. And I, I'm really excited to see this one next year. And then Ryan, I know you're a big racing fan. Uh, I, th I thought the Gran Turismo 7 was one of the few maybe missteps of the showing today. But then again, I'm not a big racing fan. So I want to know what you thought. Yeah, I mean, it was it was probably their maybe their most underwhelming of their major first party games that they showed. Mm -hmm. But uh, to be fair to it, this was a stream that we knew ahead of time was going to be broadcast. It was going to be streamed in 1080 30. Uh, so that is that will not do any racing game, particularly a next gen racing game, any favors like so on the stream, it looked no better and mm -hmm. possibly even worse than the latest Forza, uh, Forza Horizon or Forza Motorsport game. But I have little doubt that once once we see clean 4K 60 gameplay, it's going to look fantastic. I mean, I, I do think Forza has definitively shot past Gran Turismo as the premier racing sim and hardcore racing game but that's not to speak ill of gran turismo i mean mm -hmm. seven still looks great there looks like they're going to be again their thing is they've they've just got hundreds and hundreds of cars in there which we saw glimpses of in the trailer so yeah eager to see more but but yeah the the uh the 1080 30 stream did not do it any favors yeah and then a, a genuine surprise during the show for me was uh the reveal of hitman 3 uh not only that that we're getting a new hitman but that it, it's a three and not a game as service that's going to be continually updated, which is what the last Hitman was. Uh, Jonathan, was that a surprise to you? Yeah, definitely. It, it's one of those things where we sort of were expecting this studio to continue working with Hitman based on a uh, recent blog post from them and things they've been talking about, but I didn't really expect it to show up here. Um, I think the work that's been done in these last two Hitmen, even if it's not a franchise I know exceptionally well over the years, um, it's been really impressive to see these reboots uh, and the continuation of the franchise go on. And I'm sure this one is going to continue to impress uh, and bring some interesting stuff and third-party publishers that Sony was able to bring into this uh, portfolio for the show. Yeah, uh, Damon, one, the, the Hitman reboot was was the episodic one, mm -hmm. and two uh, was a, a traditional release. I reviewed that for IGN, and it was it was good. I gave it somewhere in the sevens, but I agree with Jonathan. This this one was a pleasant surprise. This one, uh, we haven't heard that it's that it's a timed exclusive for PS5, so this one should be coming to everything. But nevertheless, it uh, it definitely looked like it had a bit of a bigger scale and scope to it, and I'm I'm all for that. But there's a couple things we didn't uh, learn about today or hear about, and that is the PlayStation 5 price and exact release date. Jonathan, is uh, were you expecting to to learn more about those today, or do you think that there's still plenty of time for Sony to sort of dole out that information? Yeah, I, I was not really expecting that for today. You know, uh, they had so much to show off with just the console itself and obviously so many games to really highlight. I think they didn't need the price and the date on top of that. As much as it would be nice to know, obviously Microsoft and Sony have really been in sort of this weird game of chicken uh, about price and date for this generation. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure they're both going to hold off until they need to get pre-orders up. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not surprised we didn't get it today. And Ryan, what's your current feeling on... Are, 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 they, are these consoles going to come in at the exact same price point, or are we going to be seeing one consider, possibly considerably more expensive than the other? No, well, I, we were expecting three consoles between the Lockhart, mm -hmm. the Series X, and the PS5, and now we've got four. Right. Uh, I mean, three officially, but Lockhart's probably real, uh, and I'm sure we'll hear more about it in the next month or two. So it seems like it's going to be Lockhart on the low end price-wise, uh, and then it's just a question of where, uh, so that you, where does the PlayStation Five Digital Edition fit in mm -hmm. price wise? Obviously cheaper than the than the PS Five with the disc. But I, Jonathan mentioned the game of chicken. I I really think that uh, Microsoft is going to either match or I think there's a very good chance that Series X will undercut the PS Five with meaning disc version to disc version. And Sony probably knows that. And that might be part of what the digital edition is all about is trying mm -hmm. to negate that and, uh, and have, you know, equal footing on the price. We haven't even gotten to some of the big games of the show, uh, like uh, the sequel to Horizon Forbidden, what was West. it called? Forbidden, Forbidden West. West. Yeah. Uh, or the Demon Souls remaster. So real quick, before we have to wrap up here, Jonathan, what were some of your personal highlights from the show today? 
I mean, those two that you just named definitely were. I was I was itching to talk about them. Uh, Horizon looks so great, uh, like a really exactly the evolution of that franchise that I want. And Demon Souls is a fan cult favorite from the PS3 coming back. Uh, I'm excited, especially with all the evolutions of the Soulsborne genre, to see what that game has learned and how it evolves it even further. How about you, Ryan? Uh, easy answer. It's a common answer, but Spider-Man. I mean, it, it wasn't a surprise. Maybe the Miles Morales aspect of it a little bit, but I, I so enjoyed Spider-Man. I mean, I, I've I've been uh, I love Insomniac going back to. I mean, their Ratchet's great, and the new one looks especially great. But uh, Sunset Overdrive, just a, an underrated cult classic on the Xbox One, and then Insomniac moves back over to Sony and takes a lot of those Sunset elements and really blows it out with Spider-Man, which is just so good. And so getting to getting to go back and revisit that world, I, I can't wait. Halo Infinite versus versus Spider-Man minus uh, Miles Morales this fall. Everybody wins in that scenario. <laughs> yeah, but the question on my mind for Spider-Man Mor- Miles Morales is, is it a sequel or is it like a sort of a expansion the way um, Uncharted uh, Lost Legacy was? I, you idea? know, it, it's hard to say right now. It definitely looks like we're going to still be in Manhattan. Uh, it takes place in a different season. Uh, clearly, it was winter time during the trailer. So they are likely pulling from a lot of the work they did to build New York and build a lot of the assets that they had in that first game. And so even if it is sort of a 1.5 in between one and two, you know, I don't think that takes away from this being any this is still a major launch title because of how big that first Spider-Man game was. I, I can't uh, overstate, I think, how, how big this will be for launch. But if PlayStation 5 games uh, are not working on PS4, that means uh, everyone who you know has their PS4 copy of uh, Spider-Man, they're going to have to get a PS5 to play Miles Morales. Exactly. That's how they're getting you to buy a PS5. I think this is a smart move. <laughs> Uh, okay, Ryan, we've been talking about um, how impressive Sony's showing was today. Uh, where does that leave Microsoft? What do you think Microsoft's next move needs to be? I mean, there's there's no there's no overstating this. That there is incredible pressure on Microsoft with their first party July showcase. They've been talking the talk for years now of, hey, we know we have a first party exclusive problem. We've been acquiring studios. We've been building new studios. I think they... There is, there is so much riding on, on July. They have to get it right. They have to impress. Uh, I, I, they at least have the opportunity, though, because this is the first time, really, uh, that Microsoft has gotten a chance to, to have the last word and to fire back, because typically Microsoft does their press conference early in E3, and Sony always goes last. So now Sony is really kind of gone first, yeah. and, and Microsoft will have a chance to go again. But I really think Microsoft cannot hold anything back, even the, the stuff that's really early in development. We've got to see Fable. We've mm-hmm. got to see what the initiative is doing, whether it's a Perfect Dark reboot or something else. They've got to just go all guns blazing in July. And I'm rooting for them, and I can't wait to see uh, how they respond. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what Microsoft does next. Uh, like we were saying earlier, they were sort of leading the conversation on next gen for so long in my mind sony has maybe sort of leapfrogged over them now jonathan oh yeah would you agree with that jonathan oh totally yeah i i think the showing from this hour plus long uh showcase of games that we're going to get in the you know this holiday season but also in the years to come we saw even some 2022 games not in there i think uh th- this was a really really strong showing and it was their first showing so we are definitely going to get more in the lead up to launch yeah So last week's poll was, is cross-generational compatibility important right now? 56, nearly 57% said, no, I'm getting a next-gen console to play games my current console can't. While the remaining 43 said, yes, I want to play next-gen games on my current-gen console. Those are the people that would like to play Spider-Man Miles Morales without having to buy a PlayStation 5. Uh, Now we have a new poll for you for next week. We want to know, what was your favorite announcement from the Sony conference? You'll be able to vote at IGN.com, and we'll share the results with you next week. And that is about going to do it for this edition of Next Gen Console Watch. Thank you both Ryan and Jonathan. Don't forget, all summer of gaming long, IGN is asking you to consider donating to the World Health Organization by clicking the Tiltify donation link in the description of your video player. 
All donations will go to the COVID-19 Response Fund, dedicated to studying, tracking, and combating COVID-19, as well as the Bail Project in support of Black Lives Matter and reuniting families in need. By donating, you'll have a chance to win codes for games like Resident Evil 3 and swag from companies like id Software. Keep those donations coming. It looks like we crossed $16,000 in the last half hour, which is pretty awesome. Thanks to everyone who has donated. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for a new episode of News, Games, and More right after the break. Tomorrow, Summer of Games continues with IGN Expo 3, plus special editions of GameScoop. I like that show. News, Games, and More, and up at noon, we will see you there. We're happy to present IGN's Summer of Gaming, featuring the latest and greatest in game reveals, news, trailers, next-gen coverage, and more. Our month-long event features our first-ever series of IGN Expos, where you'll get first looks at world premiere game trailers, exclusive game demos, and interviews you won't find anywhere else. IGN's Summer of Gaming, only on IGN and IGN One on Samsung TV+.